Hello, and welcome to our webinar, Improving Student Social Emotional Health with Tier 2 Interventions for Managing Stress and Utilizing Social Support. Our presenters today are Steve Elliott, Christine Malecki, and Michelle Demeray, the authors of the SSIS SEH CIP slash T2 and CIP, uh, both in intervention programs shown to improve the social and emotional health of students. Steve is the Mickelson Foundation professor at Arizona State University, and Christine and Michelle are both uh, presidential professors at Northern Illinois University. And these authors are all active school-based researchers and committed to training mental health professionals to support all students. Our webinar today is presented in broadcast audio. Please turn up your computer speaker as there are no dial-in options. We also are presenting with closed caption. To initiate closed caption on your computer screen, please click on the box at the bottom of your screen titled CC, click on live transcript and select show subtitle. There's a webinar handout for this session and it will be in the uh, chat box right now and um, please type your questions, concerns, and comments into the Zoom Q&A. We will answer questions live time permitting. If your question is not answered during the live presentation, please fill out the, the follow-up form that, that will pop up in the link after the webinar. Webinar certificates of attendance will be automatically emailed to you within three weeks if you participated for the full 60 minutes. With all that being said, I'll turn it over to Dr. Stephen Elliott. Well, hey, thank you, thank you, Sherry. Good day, folks. Um, welcome. This is the, the fourth uh, in a series of four webinars. We started last spring, kind of come full circle now, um, on the SSIS SEL um, Integrated uh, Solution Program. So this is on Review 360. Um, the, the material we're going to present today is, is focusing on the kind of the final piece of the puzzle. It's a tier two intervention program called based on the class-wide intervention program, which is a tier one program. We're going to um, uh, work as a uh, team here today. I'm going to create some context for you about the, uh, the, what we're referring to as the SIP T2, tier two class-wide intervention program. Um, we're going to then um, uh, focus in on stress and the, the lessons around stress and stress management, and then follow that with lessons around social support. There's more to SIPT2 than just those two areas, but time doesn't really allow, and these are featured areas that we think are really fundamental. Um, it's, it's also a pleasure to, um, to work with Christine and Michelle. Uh, we're co-authors of this of this product, but we've been working together for 20 some years. And um, this work has brought us together doing work in Ohio, where it originally started an Ohio well, uh, student or school wellness program or project. In Arizona, where we're working on a multi-tiered support system project with the state. In Illinois, where Christine and Michelle have now just kicked off an IES grant where they're doing uh, an effectiveness study of SIPT2. And um, in Australia, I've been working. So uh, we're out and about doing this. And uh, But what's most important to us is to really talk to our colleagues right here um, uh, today uh, who've joined us. So this is uh, the beginning. Um, in, and I've obviously mentioned Christine and Michelle. Uh, we're leaving you here with our emails. So if there are follow-up questions, feel free to contact us. There will be an opportunity to ask some questions uh, throughout this today. Our goals here are to describe the use of this, uh, what we're calling SEH, social emotional health. That's Goes, it includes SEL, but it's greater than that. Um, and, and a part of the SIP T2 program, there's two parts. You'll, I'll say more about that. We're going to feature the initial phase of SIP T2. That's referred to as BIGS, Brief Intervention Group Support. And then we're going to, as I said, focus on lessons dealing with stress and focus on lessons dealing with social support. 
as we go forward. So let's uh, let's meet the family, so to speak, here. Um, uh, that uh, and how they all work together, uh, hopefully, to achieve a solution. And what I mean by family, I mean the family of products that's in Review 360. And without uh, the the um, this four part series has actually started on the left hand side. We last year we talked about screeners. Then we talked about uh, assessment broadly was uh, progress monitoring. And, and, and then we spoke more about tier one, which is where we have the SSIS, SEH class-wide intervention program. So this program, even though we call it tier two, I think as you get familiar with it, you're gonna see, and, and again, there's no hard and fast rules about what's tier two and what's tier three as I, as I travel across the country. But I think you're gonna find that it'd be quite useful for either tier two or tier three work. Um, these, uh, these areas are now showing you the actual products, the covers, if you will, of the products. Um, and you can see uh, that there are five pieces, a couple assessment projects, uh, three actually, and then two intervention projects. What's really interesting, important from our perspective is these are all aligned with the Castle model of social emotional learning. And they go beyond that, by the way, but they all feature uh, uh, elements dealing with the five areas emphasized both from an assessment standpoint, from an intervention standpoint with CASEL. Self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, responsible decision-making, and relationship skills. And so it's, it's a fully aligned system. What you assess is what you teach. What you teach is what you can assess, which is pretty powerful, pretty useful in terms of trying to figure out what's working. Now, SIPT2, I'm giving you a little warning here, right? Be aware, the SIPT2 requires training to implement with integrity. This isn't one of those things you just can kind of open up the manual and in 15 minutes be ready to go. SIP is kind of like that. The SIP program probably takes about an hour, an hour and a half to get familiar with the content. All of the content for both the SIP and the SIPT2 are online. So you got to allow a little time just to figure out how to navigate it and understand it. But there's some pretty significant skills necessary to work in the bigs program, this the group that you're gonna that we're gonna talk about. It it really does require well-trained school psychologists or related mental health professionals to lead these groups. And these groups are generally gonna be of uh, between, we recommend, between four and eight or 10 students. Um, and so who are these students? Well, they're gonna vary as you go across the country, but these are students who generally had some difficulty in tier one, they might have some classroom management issues, they might have some learning difficulties, but they need, for sure, they need more support and more opportunities to practice and develop their skills. And so group leaders, uh, really need to be good at working with children, managing children, teaching and delivering, keeping them together, and then learning the content. And we're going to feature stress content and social support content today. We think, based on our experiences in Arizona, Illinois, Ohio, that most people are going to have to invest about eight to 10 hours really to, to absorb the, the material and content. These, there's online modules that we've created, some 20 minutes long, some 30 minutes long, that literally pace you through all the lessons and the setup and the management of the SIP T2 program, okay? So um, there's a theory behind this. There's a model that's driving uh, what we're focusing on. And you're looking at it here, the big orange ball, so to speak, um, stresses what? It stresses three principal aspects. We want to work with children to have them learn about managing their stress. We want to teach them actually a, a healthy behavior routine about managing stress. We want to work with them to recognize how to go about getting social support from from friends, from adults, from teachers that they work with, and also how to give social support. Those two elements interact, as you can see in this picture. Social support is, as Christine's going to tell you, is a stress buffer, okay? Social support is uh, also 
really uh, one of those places that where where a lot of modeling, a lot of learning about appropriate social behavior occurs. So our our overall set of guiding principles are to manage stress, to establish social supportive relationships, to refine actual social behaviors, social emotional behaviors. That's not going to be featured today, but uh, it, much of what we do in Bigs actually nurtures some really important social behaviors. And, and another really important output come is to teach children about goal setting. So if a child has some stress difficulties, we're gonna, they might pick that as a goal that they wanna improve their management stress. Or if they have difficulty getting support or giving support, that may be a goal. But again, the overarching SIPT2 program focuses off all four of these areas. Okay? So BIGS lessons, that's that's the first part of SIPT2, BIGS lessons, that, as I said, okay, they're going to focus on stress. They're going to focus on social support. BIMS lessons, I haven't said anything about that. That's the second piece of the SIPT2 program. What does that stand for? Brief Improvement Modules for Students, BIMS and BIGS. And BIMS really actually pulls upon a lot of what's already in the SIP program, tier one that's been demonstrated to be highly effective, a What Works Clearinghouse program. That's what gets taught in the social emotional learning skills. So this is, this is again, going a little deeper into the content on the far left-hand side of this screen, you can see what we call a SIG, <laughs> Student Improvement Guidebook. So in the SIP T2 program, in the first phase, BIGS, that we're going to talk about today, there's some activities that's associated with each of the lessons. Many of the activities, as you're going to see, are really getting kids to be self-reflective, to think about what stresses them, to think about what they do when they're stressed, to think about what their social support needs, emotional support, informational needs are, and how they could go about getting it. So there's a workbook activity that's connected to SIP. But on the bottom level of this, you're going to see kind of facsimiles of some of the PowerPoint slides. So there, every lesson has a set of PowerPoint slides that you as a group leader can depend upon, use to drive and communicate. And, and, and you can see a little uh, images of, of eight to nine students down there. Um, these are uh, embedded in animated characters that are embedded in the PowerPoints. More about that. You're going to see some example PowerPoints. On the far right-hand side is what we call a journey map. There are, um, in fact, the whole vision of SIPT2 is that we're, we're getting kids in a small group to think about going on an improvement journey. They're going to discover what it is they need to improve, and then we're going to work through the process of improving those skills and thinking about um, uh, their positive assets that they have and some of the negative behaviors that they want to uh, work together and try to reduce. But these journey maps are really communication tools. And in fact, we have put together four of these as part of this uh, output afterwards, you're going to uh, handouts that will go along with the PowerPoint slides to all those who signed up to participate today. There are one page documents and they, they're communication tools with parents. So um, we see parents as a really important partner in SIPT2, uh, educators making parents aware that children are getting involved in SIPT2. And these are tools uh, actually to, there are small little videos, one minute videos to communicate. So we spent a lot of energy trying to figure out the best ways to, to keep parents and teachers who are not involved directly in interventions, mental health professionals, school psychologists, counselors are leading it. And these are tools that they can use to get, keep everyone on this, hopefully on the same page. Now, I've, I've mentioned the acronym BIGS, the acronym BIMS. They're, they're important um, uh, illest points here about the two pieces of the SIP T2 program. Let me say some more about BIGS and BIMS. So um, you can see BIGS, we're gonna emphasize healthy behavior foundation lessons. In BIMS, we're gonna emphasize social emotional learning lessons. So these go hand in glove and um, work together to uh, 
develop, if you can, social, emotional, healthy behaviors, healthy students. So there are 12 lessons that are part of BIGS. We're going to focus on um, stress, social support. There are two products that come out of BIGS that serve as bridges, if you will, to VIMS. What are the products? One is called Get this, called a smarty gas. Well, what is that? Well, many of you have heard about it, smart goals. So smart, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time bound. And there's smart goals that are focused on improvement. And a gas, it's a really important tool. A lot of school psychologists, I suspect, know about it, but haven't maybe used it as frequently as they could. They're goal attainment scales. And what I'm showing you here is a, is a facsimile of one of the goal attainment skills we use. Just kind of a quick look at it. You can see there's five levels of performance, color-coded, kind of going from orange to green. Uh, levels as you go up are, are higher performing, better performing behaviors. This really, this is an outproduct uh, after students have learned about goal setting and, and the goals they want to achieve and when they start targeting a behavior or a cluster of behaviors they want to improve. And, and to enact this goal setting activity and this uh, improvement journey, we, we create what's called a BIMS map. Okay, a BIMS map is really, what is it? My action plan. Those of you who've been involved with behavioral contracts will look at this and say, hey, this is a simple behavioral contract. And it is that. It's a behavioral contract. It specifies the, the improvement goal. It talks about how you're going to monitor the goal, likely one of the ways you're going to monitor it with a goal attainment scale. And it also talks about, you know, what are the resources needed to do this with parent sign off on it? That's the way we propose it. So you do bigs, out products of bigs after 12 lessons. Now you can do the kind of the math. Some people say, well, that's 12 weeks. Uh, probably is. Um, it could be less than that. It could be a little longer than that. But it puts you in a position to say, does this child need more? Does he or she need assistance in terms of learning some specific social skills, social emotional learning behaviors that will allow them to achieve their goals? That could occur at a tier three. That could, a tier, could occur depending on what's going on in tier one. Um, social emotional program in your school, it could occur back there. So there's some flexibility is how we see it working. So these two products, the Smarty Gas, the BIMS map, lead to really the selection of a subset of SEL skill units. Okay. Now, so there's a lot of twos here, tier two support, two phases, two key student developed products, to achieve really what we believe would be some uh, sustainable emotional behavioral changes. Okay. Um, a little closer look at both these out products of BIGS, okay? The BIMS map, so it's kind of blowing up here so you can see it. These documents really represent a, a comprehensive behavioral contract uh, that helps operationalize the goal that a student has developed along with the group leader. A lot of group leaders are going to work with fourth graders, fifth graders, and have to help them nurture and focus on what their goal is, an achievable goal. Okay? And, and then um, work on actually developing a goal attainment scale. We expect, we give support materials, there's activities in the student improvement guidebook, that helps students learn to write a goal attainment scale. And then you can see here, I've added in the goal attainment chart that helps actually monitor progress. And these charts can be kept by the group leader, by a parent, by a teacher, and or the student in documenting how they're doing with regard to their goal attainment scale. So that's, that's kind of the context of, of uh, SIP T2 the BIGS phase in particular of SIP T2. I just want to highlight, I've said this a couple of times, a little bit about where this falls in terms of support systems, but um, many of us work in, um, in, in multi-tiered support services systems that um, are designed really to uh, maximize support for students, maximize opportunities for students to practice skills. We like to think that SIPT2 big support is, is what we call safer 
What does that mean? Safer. Well, synthesis support is really about attending to children's emotional and informational needs and, and creating, a, in effect, a mini social network where there is the opportunity to learn and work together. And if you look closely at how we deliver both SIP Tier 1 program and SIP T2, we characterize them as being safer. That is, there's a clear sequence to them. There's active, they're active in, in uh, engaging activities that kids do. Um, they're focused, very focused on, as we've said, we've already privileged stress and so social support. We, we make explicit um, behaviors that are necessary in order to achieve um, stress reduction and to achieve social support. These explicit characterizations are often, in our in our case, are referred to as healthy behavior routines. And and overarching, we think this is very responsive. Why? Because we 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 encourage kids to set goals. We encourage children to think about their personal assets, and then we want to create in the BIMS, the second phase, a personalized intervention program. So um, that's that's the vision. And it's a vision that I think we're finding in, across the states we're working in that fits very nicely into multi-tiered systems. So with that, I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna shift the focus now to um, Michelle and let her talk about understanding and managing stress and take it over, Michelle. Okay, great. Thank you, Steve. So I get to kind of show and tell some of the pieces of the lessons from, as he said, it's a 12 lesson, small group um, intervention. And this is from stress is lesson three and lesson four. So lesson three is really focused on teaching and understanding social support. And then lesson four is focused on helping kids manage um, and deal with that stress. I'm sorry, stress, not, not social support. So how they're gonna manage that stress. I love this content area because when we've been presenting it to different facilitators and social workers and school psychologists, there is a real need to help kids manage stress. Children, adolescents, all of us, ourselves, there's high levels of stress. And so helping kids understand and manage stress is I think really critical to their success as we saw in that model that Steve presented. So lesson three teaches um, about stress. And so some of the things you can see on these slides that the instructional sequence is up in the left corner. So tell, show, do. So there's, and again, I'm just showing you kind of a show and tell of some of the slides, but these are some of the key tell slides in lesson three where we're teaching kids about stress. And so you can see on the slide on the right, the top right, we're asking them what causes stress. And there are some ideas up here. Of course, there could be other things that they might talk about as well. But for example, uh, schoolwork might be something that causes stress, uh, being too busy, family stressor. So kind of helping them think about what causes stress in their lives. And then along with that, teaching them and talking to them about what stress feels like. Um, what if we have too much stress, what can that do? And we talk about what it can do to our bodies, our behavior, our habits, our moods and other kinds of things. So really, again, learning about what it is, what causes it, what it feels like. And as well, there's a emphasis on that not all stress is bad. There is sometimes stress motivates us to action. And so uh, there are certain levels of stress that are okay. But when it becomes, you know, where it's having these effects on our mood, our behavior, our body um, that are negative, that then it becomes toxic. So you can kind of see that picture down there, helping kids differentiate between tolerable stress and toxic stress as part of that teaching to an understanding of stress. I love this um, part of the lesson. We teach them how to kind of gauge their stress. It's almost a thermometer of their stress level. So we use and we introduce this stress meter. So they can look and we talk about those different levels of stress that you can have a low stress zone. You might not be very productive in that level. You can have a moderate stress zone that's in the green area on this meter and that that's a just right amount of stress. You're not overwhelmed, it's not affecting you negatively, but it might motivate you to action. And then obviously we also have that high stress level at the eight, nine and 10 
which is a more unhealthy or toxic level of stress. So we use this meter to teach them about gauging their stress. And then it's actually utilized in all of the rest of the lessons um, where we have, we ask kids their stress level before they start um, each lesson each week and have them gauge that on this meter. So it's a nice tool um, that can be used throughout the rest of the lessons. Related to that tool, we also in the lesson where we teach them and try to understand stress, we have them take a measure of stress. Um, we call these in the um, in the materials, we call them reflections, but really when you see that it's kind of a code word for taking a little assessment. So the students in the group, this is part of that SIG, that student improvement um, guide workbook that Steve talked about. They will have this questionnaire they can answer some of these questions about stress. So for example, over the past two weeks, I worried about things. I had a hard time concentrating. So they, those are a couple examples. They would answer these. The facilitator would help them, you know, answer those as well. And then um, Steve, you can click the next okay. pop up, I think. Oh, there it is. Um, so okay. also um, we would, they, after they score it, they can then graph it and look at where their stress level is to help them under, better understand their current stress levels. And so this profile is also coordinated with that mirror. So the blue is the low level of stress, the green is the just right level, and then kind of the orange color is the too much stress. So the main goal of this lesson is to learn about stress, to reflect and think about, am I experiencing any of these symptoms? And then get some feedback themselves about and plot their level of stress and kind of understand better if they're experiencing low, moderate, or high levels of stress on that. So that's all lesson three. And there's other things, um, we don't have time, but we also, in each of these, there's opportunities to practice, there's opportunities to model and role play, there's, they, there's activities to generalize. Um, there's some homework, which we call I work, that they, improvement work that they do each week. So there's a lot of other components in each lesson. We're just kind of showing you the core features in each of them. So these are the core features of lesson four, which is on managing um, stress. And so here on these two slides, again, these are the tell phase. So we're kind of teaching them about ways to manage stress. And in these, we present five real broad strategies for managing stress. So here it can be connecting with others, which Christine's going to be talking about because later there are three entire lessons dedicated to social support. But that, that is one way we can reduce stress is by connecting with others. Um, doing something they enjoy. So that can be something they enjoy doing by themselves or with others, like, you know, playing a video game, listening to music, playing basketball outside or whatever it is as one way to manage their stress. We also talk about re practicing relaxation strategies. And actually there is an even activity in the slides where they do a body scan video and practice a relaxation activity together as a group. So there's opportunities to kind of dig into some of these strategies. Um, we also talk about taking care of themselves. So just sort of preventative strategies like eating healthy, exercising, stretching, getting rest, all of that is important to manage their stress level. And then the, the last one here is changing or improving their thinking. So this is really focusing their thinking from the negative to the positive. So a little bit of, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy. So if they're stressed and they're thinking, I'm going to fail my math test to reframe that and think about something positive. I'm gonna do my best as I can on my math test or something like that. So we teach these five, five broad strategies, but one of the things about these strategies is that you couldn't always do them. If you're about to go take a math test, you can't really engage in many of these activities right then. And so we also teach them on the next slide, um, we teach them a routine. And so Biggs has a lot of routines, which, are a way for them to remember some of these skill steps or activities. And so this, in the lessons, this is really the first routine they learn. And it's called the healthy stress management routine. So basically this is something they can do. I talked to them about, this is something you could do anywhere. We have those other five broad categories, but this you could do anywhere without people really noticing significantly. So again, this, the strategies that we teach them or the steps that we teach them are one, to rate their stress level. So that's the meter we just saw. So they would rate their stress level. They might say they're nervous about their math test. They're really stressed. Maybe they're at an eight or a nine. 
Then we teach them a breathing routine. Now this is actually a routine they've already learned because we teach them this in our very first lesson as part of something that we call an opening meeting. And it's part of every lesson. It's kind of a routine to get the, the lesson started each week. So they have learned this, but they learn that in this routine, they can do that three times in practice. So that is breathing in for a count of four, holding your breath for a count of seven and breathing out for a count of eight. I don't know if any of you have heard of that. I use it now ever since we've put it in this lesson. I use it all the time now, mostly in the nights because I wake up at 3 a.m. and I practice this breathing routine to try to get me back to sleep. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, another thing we talked about stretching. So then after they do that breathing routine, they can stretch in their seat to have a nice big stretch. They can focus on something positive for 10 seconds. So again, whatever that is. And then at the very end, they can reflect on how they feel and actually even revisit that stress meter. So I just went through all these steps before I started my stress was at eight or nine. Now it's about a five or six. So now I can go forward and you know do whatever it was I need to do. Or if I'm still really stressed, I could repeat this routine. So this is just, again, a, something they can use at any time and um, you'll, the students will practice it in their small group, it'll be modeled, they'll practice it, role play it together, and then they'll think about times they can use it for, to generalize. Think about times they can use that routine throughout their week when they're feeling stress. Another thing we do is we have some mantras. We haven't really um, talked about those, but our mantra for stress is manage it. And so you can see the little flag in the bottom left corner. Our goal is really to teach them stress, like you can manage it. And that kind of is, again, another positive kind of viewpoint on stress and thinking about stress. All right. Thanks, okay. Michelle. Let's yeah. uh, move to Christine. We'll talk about social support and the lessons there. Great. Well, I'm going to introduce our peps right away. So we'll stay on this slide for a second. You can see that those cartoon characters or those characters that they that you've seen in some of the slides on the very first slide for each lesson, we actually have real um, pictures or photos of individuals that then those characters kind of emulate. And at the very beginning of each lesson, we introduce what we call a pep, a personal empowerment point. And it's it's again another positive statement. So we're going to talk about the lessons that. Um, a couple of the peps for those lessons are I can ask for and accept the support I need to feel good and I can offer and give support to important people in my life. So let's talk about the three social support lessons. First, we have lesson five. So these lessons do come right after the two stress lessons that Michelle was talking about. In lesson five, it's, it's structured similarly to lesson three in that just like in lesson three, they learned about stress and reflected on stress. Here they learn about social support and reflect on social support. So there's three aspects of social support that the students learn in lesson five. First, they learn that social support is reciprocal. So this isn't just about, I need to get support from people. I need my teacher to help me. I need my parent to pay attention to me. I need my friends to provide support to me. It's also about what can I do for others? How can I support my parent? How can I ask my teacher if they need any help? How can I support my friends? So they learn about social support being reciprocal, that it is that um, give and take um, and that social support goes both ways. So that's a big learning objective for lesson five is learning that social support is reciprocal. They also learn about social support networks. So they reflect on the different people in their life that either they might be providing support to or those different people in their life that they might get support from. So, um, you know, it's just, again, reflecting. Sometimes we think narrowly about our social support network and we just think about our family and maybe our friends. But this is really having the students think about other adults in their life that might provide them support or that they can support and other peers in their life. Stephen mentioned this before. What's neat about the 12 bigs lesson is that it creates a mini social support network. So that becomes another source of support for the students and other individuals that they can provide support. Finally, we teach them about different types of support. And we've been doing research in this area since, you know, the mid 90s. 
maybe the early 90s, I shouldn't admit that, but for a long time. And we know there's a lot of types of support, but we focused in for the students on emotional support and informational support. Emotional support is that caring, attention, um, feeling positive, and informational support is being able to have the information you need from those people around you. So is your teacher letting you know the information that you can, so that you can be successful in the classroom? So they're taught about support and then they're gonna reflect on their support. So just like they reflected on stress and graphed it out, they're gonna reflect on social support. You can see that they're, these are just tidbits, but there's only eight items for accepting social support and there's eight items for giving social support. Four items are about an adult in their life that they might accept support from and four items are from a peer or a friend in their life that they might accept support from. And then on the right side, we're looking at giving support. You th They think about one adult they might want to give support. Maybe it's their dad that they're thinking about giving support to. Um, or they are then thinking about a friend that they might give support to. And they're going to answer on these items. So, for example, if they're thinking about their friend, number seven, my friend gives me good advice. Uh, that that often happens. My friend often gives me advice, then they would circle a two. So you, you support them in this activity, but they score it and then they plot it. So when they plot it, they're able to visually see accepting support on the left, giving support on the right. And you can see to it um, from an adult and a friend and to an adult and a friend. They can see if their scores fall in the yellow range, it means they need more or they need to give more. If the score falls in a green range, it means they're pretty good in that area. So I think um, in terms of what we know about support, Steve mentioned that social support is a stress buffer, and that's true in a lot of areas. But what um, some of the main research findings around so social support is that what we call the main effect model or the general benefits model. We just generally benefit from having support in our lives and from giving others support. And so this helps students reflect on those areas to be able to see where they might wanna beef, beef that up. Okay, so then we move into lesson six. Lesson six then is focused on the asking for and accepting social support. So getting support from others. And we do a number of activities, like Michelle said, there's lots of different ways that we, and it's very, it's safer. So it's, it, and it's explicit and sequenced and active. The students walk through the lessons and the different activities, building their knowledge and getting practice in this, in this area. So they think about how would I know if, um, if I need more support, you know, what, what does that feel like? What does that look like if I need support? And then how do I ask for support? How would I let others know that I need support? So we talk about those things. We give a lot of examples. A lot of times in these lessons and bigs, we do a lot of examples and non-examples, which is a great way for students to learn a concept is by showing examples and non-examples. And then lesson six ends really with students having learned and practiced a healthy social support ask and accept routine. So the steps of this routine are decide that you need support, identify the type of support needed, ask someone for that support, and then accept the support and say thank you. Then we focus on um, giving other support in lesson seven. So offering to support and giving support to others. Same thing, lots of ways that they learn about it, that they see examples and non-examples, and that they, they look at or they think about how would I know if someone needs support? How might I tune into that? Um, and then how, how would I offer support? So those steps are decide if someone needs support, identify the type of support they need, offer the person support, and give the person the support if they accept it. What I love about this is that we really talk about the subtleties of giving support to others because people don't always want that support. Or maybe they want it, but not today. I've had enough. Like too many people are coming at me. Too many people are asking, are you okay? Is there anything I can do for you? So we talk about that, that that's part of the skill is being able to read and being able to explicitly offer, but understand that they may not want to, that person may not want to accept your support at that time. And we really talk about that and what some alternatives are, what you can do then if someone says, yeah, no, I'm okay, not today. 
So I, I think that the combination of lessons six and seven and these two routines really provide students with tools to be able to benefit from what we know is really beneficial to their outcomes in many areas, which is social support in that reciprocal way, both accepting it um, and giving it to others. Super. And I think we're gonna, yeah. Yeah, go to yeah. So this is uh, this is a point in the, in the session that uh, potentially Lori, uh, who's been monitoring the chat box for uh, Christine, Michelle, and I. Um, are there questions that you want to direct to one of us or some observations you've made, Lori, about uh, from participants today before we get into summarizing the session? Yeah, we did have one question about if this can be used in private schools and or private settings. Well, um, I guess it didn't direct it at anybody in particular, but sure. Um, I think I should let me, let me define how we built this or for who we built this. We were, um, this is a small group defined between four and 10 in, in our manual. This is for um, children, we think most likely starting in about fourth grade. We know there's been some places where people have used it in third grade. It's a bit of a language load, et cetera, on it. But part of Part of why we situated it there, too, was thinking that when there's universal SEL programs, you really want to give a, chance, a child a chance to thrive and survive in those programs. And also um, a lot of tier two programs in, across other disciplines kind of get in place in third or fourth grade. So uh, I see no reason that this couldn't be used at all in uh, private schools or uh, agency-based settings where there's predictable groups. Group membership, I think, we don't have an answer, definitive answer out of the research on this yet, but uh, it's it would be useful if you're thinking that that the, the bigs phase, that 12 lesson phase is something you want to um, uh, strive for. It's useful to have that um, with a fairly stable group of students, as, as Christine and Michelle both have indicated, what's, what's happening uh, is that you're actually building a mini social support network. Um, we haven't shared with you all the details of an opening meeting and how we get kids together and that whole process, but there's a lot of opportunity to connect with peers. And in many cases, we're finding that kids that are that are suggested to be in tier two need that. That's where they're struggling. They're either withdrawn or they have some internalizing difficulties and don't get along well. So stability of this big phase uh, uh, with whether it be four students, five students, seven students is desirable. Uh, other comments, Christine, Michelle, to that question? No? Okay. Anything else, Lori? Yeah, yeah. we just got an another question about um, if the lessons are meant to be done in any particular order or can you skip around? Yeah, yeah. Good question. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that as an opportunity to move into the takeaways because I will address that. You'll see that there is a sequence that we recommend. So, um, I do know that some people really want to use stress and they're going to say, we're just going to teach the stress lessons. OK, I think there's a benefit to doing that. But I think the larger benefit is to see, again, you can see how social support can be a stress buffer. So I wouldn't recommend jumping around. I would recommend sequencing, but I can see people doing portions of this and not all of it. OK, so I'll say a little bit more about that and enrich that answer as I go forward here. So um, a couple of takeaways today from my perspectives, and uh, I think time's going to allow at the end that Christine and Michelle can chime in if they have additional points. But um, the, the, uh, the the oops, I went the wrong way. Let me back up. Sorry, folks. So the this SSIS, social emotional health. SIP T2 program really supports students on a goal-directed social behavior improvement journey. Okay, we we want we want to cultivate students to think about I I need to improve and I'm willing to join this group to to try to figure out ways to improve. 
Okay, that's the journey part. In the big space, which was featured today, uh, evidence-based practices uh, and structured learning activities from the uh, uh, SSIS SIP are used to really create this mini social network where students safely self-reflect about their positive and potential negative behaviors. Uh, we work on learning four healthy behavior routines. You've been given insights into two of them today, okay? So you've given insights into stress and seen some materials and social support. But the other two routines are about goal setting and about recognizing positive behaviors, okay? And that positive behaviors can override and replace negative behaviors. So the, the BIM space, which was only introduced, but not in any great detail, it follows the big phase. It's assu it assumes that a student now has designed a goal that they want to improve and that um, the group leader or other individuals, might be a teacher, et cetera, would get engaged in working on specific social emotional learning behaviors that would facilitate achievement of that goal. The, the program requires training. It requires a qualified uh, group leader. We, we call this a SIPT2 ready group leader. Who are these people? Well, most likely school psychologists, counselors, social workers. Um, and they're, they typically are involved in implementing with a group of six to eight students who need more than what a tier two program can offer. I've mentioned a couple of times tier one programs, et cetera. And, and of course, this, this program in, in Review 360 is paired with uh, a tier one program called the SSIS SEH SIP. We've seen other people use this with other programs, other tier one programs very effectively. So <laughs> what's here? This, it, these are the 12 lessons, okay, that we've, and we've focused on lessons three, four, dealing with stress management, five, six, seven, dealing with social support. This addresses that question about uh, other units jumping around, et cetera. We have a sequence. We recommend you start with lesson one, dealing with introducing bigs. This is really starting building the group and giving children insights into why are you here? What are you going to do in this group when you come together with these four or five other people, some of who you don't know yet? And, and then we're going to initiate in lesson two, thinking about the importance of a goal, having a goal that's achievable. You know, some students will have a goal that's really useful and valuable, but it's it's going to take four or five years to achieve it. So what we want to do is say, OK, great goal. But what can you start doing today or tomorrow or next week to help you achieve that goal? So that's uh, that's lesson two. You know, lessons three, four. You got a sample of that. You know a bit about lessons five and six. And then there's then there's lesson um, starts with lesson eight is really about getting kids to appreciate their repertoire of positive social behaviors. They all have some, but also recognizing that they have some potential competing negative behaviors. And just like the activity book that you saw where there's some reflections about stress and reflections about social support behaviors, there we ask them to self-reflect about their positive behaviors, SEL skills, their negative behaviors, internalizing, externalizing behaviors, and, and once they've sorted through that, that's where really lesson 10 and 11 and 12 move towards, okay, let's go back now and think about what we've learned about goals and let's start, let's, let's focus in on a, 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 a behavior or a cluster of behaviors, self-management behaviors, relationship skill behaviors, stress management behaviors. Those are choices and let's develop a goal to move forward. And, and let's write that down. That's just where we're going to create that goal attainment scale, that multi-level scale. That's where we're going to create a my action plan to bring this to focus, to communicate with a parent or a teacher or another professional to help them move forward. Um, these are all part of what we what we call this our, our set of four healthy behavior routines. And then uh, along the way today, um, you, you heard Michelle mention when she was talking about the stress management routine that we have a mantra. 
And that mantra is manage it. Well, we have a mantra for social support, give and get it. We have a mantra, a flag here illustrated for, for goal setting. Picture it, you know, as we often, we get kids to try to visualize what they'd be doing. So that's picture it. And then we um, have this mantra about focusing on positive behaviors to replace negative behaviors. And the mantra is positive behavior wins. So these are talked about a lot in the program from really from day one. Um, and, and it's our way of, of giving it a short little capture of these routines that we're trying to mention. So with that, I want to now um, focus on just a couple takeaways about the manage it, okay, or stress manage it routine. Stress is something that we all experience, uh, and it's all around us. So we, we really do need to understand it, and we need some go-to strategies. You and I as adults and our children around us need some go-to strategies uh, that they can use. So you, you heard today, we encourage students to reflect on the causes of stress. Um, they get some self-insight by completing an assessment. We want students to start using technically a hypothetical stress meter, uh, as introduced by Michelle, the 10-point stress meter, to, to characterize. How am I feeling today? Low stress, moderate stress, high stress. Um, and we want them then to act upon that. Um, recognizing that low and moderate stress that can be tolerable and it's probably not problematic for short periods of time, but high stress is a problem. Unless it's very short, very acute, it can be a problem. It can be a problem that affects not just how you breathe and think and feel, it can affect your metabolic system, your adrenal system. So important. So high levels of stress, are problematic and we really want children and health professionals around children to understand that and have ways to communicate with children about it effectively. Okay? So effective tactics for managing stress, they were laid out as part of what we call a healthy behavior stress management routine. Breathing was part of it, connecting with others, physical activity, good sleep. So that's, that's the story in a nutshell, about stress management, uh, stress management. Um, but as as Christine and Michelle both said, we have ways in our twelve lessons actually to to talk about stress almost every lesson. So this is a recurring theme, a way to get insights into it. And I think through twelve lessons over twelve to fourteen weeks, children learn a lot about stress. They also learn a lot about social support and how to give it and how to get it. Okay, Social support involves really, as you can tell, self-awareness and social awareness behaviors. Okay? It's reciprocal, as emphasized. It's, um, it is reciprocal with peers, with parents, with teachers when it's working really well. It's reciprocal. So what did we stress? We know that social su support often can be a stress buffer, but it's more than that, okay? It, we encourage students to reflect on this with a, with a student improvement guidebook where they, they kind of rate the two sides of social support, giving it and getting it. Um, it sounds easy. And, and as Christine said, there's a lot of nuance to um, reading people and understanding ways to appropriately ask for uh, support when you need it. It's hard, actually, for some students to ask for help. So we recognize there's multiple types of support, um, and we emphasize uh, emotional support, informational support. If you go further on this, there's material support. There's a variety of other things that people can ask for and need. But we examine the steps detailed steps. This is part of that safer model where we get focused and explicit. And we we were we, we talk about a sequence of you make some decisions, you identify what you need, you ask, and then you accept and say thank you, etc. So there is a healthy behavior routine for giving and getting support. And and all of this, as I tried to indicate at the outset, really folds into a nicely fits into a a multi-tiered support system. Uh, we believe that SIPT2 um, starts and is well situated as a tier two intervention program. 
As you work through bigs, it clearly sets it tier two. As you move into BIMs, where you start individualizing or customizing, it, it may become a tier three program in some way. So here's the, the take on this. If you've been with us through a series of the seminars we've done here on, for Review 360, um, you, you understand that there's a universal program, tier one. Um, it's got seven healthy behavior foundations, and, and it features 30 uh, social emotional learning skills. We feature today um, portions of the BIGS phase of SIP T2. Um, it's primarily for grades 4 to 12. We've seen people adapt it for grade 3. We've seen people make other adaptations for uh, students with some with significant emotional problems and disabilities. Um, we know that um, when you go to the BIMS phase, you get quite customized, and that could fit, depending on where you work and live, could fit a tier two intensive intervention. Okay. So um, that's the intervention side of Review 360. If you take the step back and ask yourself, well, what else is in Review 360? We've covered these in earlier webinars. These have been recorded. You can go to the Pearson website and get access to this. But you can see actually that the, the um, uh, Review 360 program is a true SEL integrated solution because there's assessments that align with the interventions. And uh, with that, I'm mindful of our time. Um, I don't know, Lori, is there, are there any other last minute questions or comments that you have uh, that you want to make today? Um, we had a couple of questions that we were able to answer in the chat. Um, maybe you might, I think you touched on most of those in your presentation. I did add a link or I'll put a link to the chat um, to your to the list of Pearson's assessment consultants. If you would like some additional information, feel free to reach out to those individuals. But That's otherwise, great. I think we are we are good. Good, good. Christine, Michelle, thanks for joining me and Lori today. Um, and um, with that, folks, we say thank you for taking the time and learning about SIPT2. Oh. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Thank you.